Today's sponsor is all related to your relationship with your good old dad. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that means our sponsor is Manscaped, coming at us with a special, special sponsor all about Father's Day 2021. We all know that quarantine has been long and overdue, and some people get a little too comfortable, even your dad. And so this is why Manscaped is providing the perfect package kit, which includes everything that your dad needs to take his <laughs> hashtag dad bot to the next level. But there's a new challenger in the mix, the Lawnmower 4.0. Yes, I thought luxury ball shaving was fun a while ago, but now they've actually upgraded their game and they've provided us with a 4.0 waterproof electric trimmer. Now, after trying this out for myself, I have to say the craftsmanship is quite impeccable. It has ceramic blade with skin safe technology, meaning that you can put this around your balls very worry free. And since we all know dads around the world love cool gadgets like smartphones and whatnot, you can tell him this is a smart razor. He even has some wireless charging technology. It'll blow his mind. A 90 minute full charge experience. You can get every, every hair around your ball with that kind of charge time. Let me be honest with you. You know, this thing even has a multifunction on off. You tap three times and it starts a travel lock. Uh, basically, it's great for the TSA. You know, people like me that get checked for suspicious things inside their bags all the time. Actually, really good feature, by the way. Manscaped is much larger than a ball trimming corporation, okay? They actually have more tools and formulas to help you cover every aspect of your body. Things like the Sheer 2.0 Nail Kit, Foot Duster Foot Deodorant Spray, and even the Refined Cologne. And if you can't trust this razor, you can trust the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped when it comes to grooming themselves to become that modern man. <laughs> Get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use promo code SOG at manscaped.com. Very much their project, but we wanted to celebrate their announcement on our stage since this is a game that PlayStation fans have been very, very, very vocal about.出張に行っても、どこ行っても、え、3はどうなった ?3はどうなった Shenmue 3 will be the story you have waited for, but this Kickstarter will be real success when you choose to make it the full-on Shenmue experience you have dreams of. The fate of Shenmue is in your hands now. Why, yes, today's video does begin with an E3 announcement from 2015. Now, if you don't remember this E3 announcement, I don't blame you. There's a whole bunch of announcements that came out. But if you were a Shenmue fan, you would be surprised that after almost 15 years of waiting and sitting around, a sequel to one of your favorite games finally gets announced. Not just a sequel, but the Kickstarter to the sequel. You still got, you still got to pony up some cash across the way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it was kind of weird for me to notice this at PlayStation Z3, and at first I thought this was a straight up exclusive, but then I realized, whoa, it's a Kickstarter announcement. Now, I didn't know about Shenmue this much at the time. Granted, I've heard about this franchise. I'm not an idiot. I wasn't living under the rocks. Many gamer forums galore were talking about Shenmue and how great it was to have grown up with the series, and how if you owned the Dreamcast, it was one of those must-own games. Alongside Sonic Adventure, uh... <laughs> Sonic Adventure 2, uh, and let's not forget Fantasy Star Online. Ladies and gentlemen, Shenmue and Shenmue 2 are one of the cult classic gaming histor history greats that everyone really likes to talk about. And it's a game franchise where you're either going to absolutely love it, or you're absolutely going to hate it. And in my opinion, regardless of the outcome, you should absolutely play it, if not just to experience why people have fluffed this franchise up for almost 20 years plus. Now, Shenmue is a revenge story, followed
following the footsteps of Ryu Hazuki, avenging the murder of his father at the hands of Lan Di, a tale of a young boy leaving the native home of Japan behind to the great truths hidden in China, Hong Kong, and beyond, while doing the most mundane shit life has to offer. If that's the best way to describe it, I don't know what is, right? That, that has to be. Now, Shenmue 3 has a Kickstarter page, and if you can probably tell, who actually wanted Shenmue 3? I would say $6.3 million worth of wanting Shenmue 3 actually happened. And that's not even talking about the lofty stretch goals they had, which they met a fair amount of, but I mean, they had goals going all the way up to $11 million and beyond. Whatever this mystery tier ended up being, I swear it probably had to do with some outlandish immersive feature that uh, Yu Suzuki was bringing, whether it was a rendering of the entire world or adding more piss buckets to play. And I mean, here's an example of some of these riveting mini games this game had to offer. You are about to play Pale Toss. Thanks. Okay, about salad toss. Okay, guys, that's what this fucking game is. A fucking tossing of a salad. The fuck is this, dude? Am I about to piss in these buckets? What the fuck, dude? What is this? What the fuck? Okay, let's throw rocks in the buckets! Ah! And all of this was backed by the Save Shenmue hashtag, which, uh, believe it or not, fans gave enough money to save Shenmue quite literally. Whether or not the conclusion of the franchise actually comes is a whole nother story, but fans did fund Shenmue 3, and it ended up actually coming out. Underneath EaseNet by series creator Yu Suzuki. It wasn't just no Sega affair anymore, it was a full indie project. The best description I can give of Shenmue is it is a revenge story, where you occasionally have to file your taxes. It's a bit of a hyperbole, you don't ever have to file your taxes, but I think the general, uh, you know, uh, understanding can be attained from that. It's a game with a revenge story, but you do have to do all of the other immersive work around it. And trust me, I know the irony of playing a video game on Father's Day where the dad dies in the first five minutes. But I'm just saying, if that boy had some manscaped, he had some clean pubes before dying. That's just a shameless plug. Imagine playing Grand Theft Auto V, and after the end of every heist, there's no creative accounting that happens behind the scenes. No, you character switch into an accountant sitting underneath a, a, a safe house, actually doing the money laundering yourself. It might sound fun to a lot of people out there in the audience, and for those people, Shenmue is one your favorite games but i would wager for 90 percent of actual you know people who are just playing grand theft auto no one's sitting there to do fucking accounting after doing a pretty you know heart pounding heist if you will now let's go on further over here i never understood the appeal of this e3 at the time all right but the crowd reaction was insane like i said earlier 6.3 million dollars worth of insane 6.3 million dollars was pledged by 69,000 and plus people counting for Shenmue 3. Now, at the time, I found it a bit odd that it was coming out of Sony's E3 with a Kickstarter to gate. I guess Sony must have had a deal where they probably financed the marketing and advertising for the game and the publishing to an extent, and the rest of the bill, at least game development-wise, was footed by the actual company beyond. Now, I found it weird since it wasn't even a true PlayStation exclusive, even back then, and now that it's finally out, I believe it's an Epic Games exclusive, like years down the road from its initial announcement. But I guess it made sense during an era where multiple developers were making games off of Kickstarter, some really successful like Bloodstained, and some absolutely abysmal like Mighty Failure Number 9. And then you've got, you know, absolute cash pits like Star Citizen and shit, you name it, I could go on and on, that's a separate video right there. But this isn't a video about that, nor is it a video about Shenmue 3 even, that'll happen down this entire shitpost channel history right here. Why do I mention all of this? Why am I going down this? Because this is my story with Shenmue. This is how this franchise wormed its way back into my brain cells after years of leaving my mind. Now, at this point in time, I started playing a game franchise known as Yakuza. If you don't know what Yakuza is, it's an amazing beat-em-up franchise spanning multiple mainline games, a whole bunch of spin-offs, completely different franchises that are set in the universe as spin-offs. It is truly a meaty franchise to get into. If you've never played a Yakuza game, I don't know what the fuck you're doing. But there's a great quote about Yakuza that comes from my friend Hugbees, who said that Shenmue crawled, 
so Yakuza could run. I would actually wager to say Shinmu fucking crawled out and almost had a heart attack and keeled over, and Yakuza basically glanced at it and said, you know, there's some good things about that guy. I'm just not going to go fucking near it. I'm going to go run off in a different direction, but that's me being different. Now, in my opinion, while objectively I like to think that Yakuza is a far better franchise. It's got better world density, the simulation is better, there's a metric shit ton of things more to do in that tiny square, you know, a kilometer of land that they're giving you. Uh, the combat is definitely far more impressive through the series. In fact, several games completely change up the combat. Do you know the recent game right now, Yakuza 7, is a full-on JRPG like Dragon Quest? Yeah, you wouldn't believe it if you saw the other six games in action. And you know what? This point is subjective, but I mean, I'd even wager the story overall, game to game, is far better than whatever Shinmu has offered. But Yakuza is a franchise that's gained so much popularity in the last few years, rightfully so, pumping out solid game after solid game. Each one again filled to the brim with new content. A game where literally each iteration in the franchise not only builds upon its gameplay, but also the world and the various locales it takes place. Even the spin-off games offer their own styles of gameplay and their own perspective into the world that is already established. So if you jump into the franchise now, you'd be absolutely overwhelmed. And if it sounds like that's a negative critique, it's absolutely positive. So, finishing the story in Yakuza is never really the ending, right? I mean, there's also various sub-stories, there's patches of interconnected grinding. I mean, you'd be playing a single game for literally months if you'd be looking to, say, 100% complete them down the road. And all of that content, for the most part, is incredibly meaningful. And because of my love for Yakuza and why I went on that tangent alone is the reason why I went down the path of playing Shenmue. See, I figured if I liked Yakuza so much, I have to owe it, at least in some subconscious fucked up way, that I have to give some credit to its actual predecessor, spiritually of course, in Shenmue. And that's what led me to go buy Shenmue 1, 2 on an HD collection for PlayStation and Shenmue 3. I figured I'm going to give these games a time. I'm going to give these games the absolute respect it deserves. And I understood going in that there was a bit of bias from my end. I realized that, listen, ladies and gentlemen, regardless of what it is, these are games from 1999. They're probably not going to age the best. Now, Shenmue is a weird game, okay? Like I said earlier, people will either love this game or they'll think it's a pretentious pile of shit. For me, I lean towards far into the pretentious pile of shit category, but it's also a game from 1999, and you can't completely say that because there is a lot that this game is inspired, and there is a lot this game does well, even to this day. So think about it like this. Now, this video is all based around my experience with the game, okay? My experience spending 12 to 20 hours playing this first game, all the forklift nonsenses, all of watching Tom dance for literally 12 hours a fucking day, all of this is based on my experiences. So let's begin. Now, to understand further context, this is a Dreamcast game from 1999, all right? So in the spirit of all that, we're going to give this a fair look as if this video was in 1999, all right? As if we were looking at it from that perspective. Now, some of y'all may be wondering what a Dreamcast is, and my God, does it hurt to even think that because I'm getting old. The Dreamcast was the final console Sega ever made. After spending almost two decades in the console war, all right? A sixth generation system that had some pretty solid games in its own right. Jet Set Radio, Sonic, Crazy Taxi, all of that nonsense. Hell, it had Fantasy Star Online. I know I mentioned that in the beginning, but that's one of the first console online games that actually did pretty well. It looks really good. It ran pretty well from what I've seen. I mean, the servers are dead, but hey, fair credit where fair credit is due. The controller even had this thing called a virtual memory unit. Back in the day, video games needed like, or video game consoles needed memory cards to save. So for PlayStation, you'd have a one megabyte memory card for the PlayStation 1 and an eight megabyte one for the PlayStation 2. You'd store all your save files in there. Dreamcast went above and beyond. Not only was it a memory card storing your game data and various other applications, but you could also take that memory card out of the controller and play around with it as it was an actual micro console. It, to be honest, Sega, as far as many fuck-ups that they've made in the console industry, the Dreamcast was where this console alone had some of the most interesting gimmicks that I wish some modern-day consoles at least tried to take away from, okay? Because as much as you want to crap on the Dreamcast, rightfully so in certain cases, 
This is one of the most ambitious consoles, and to this day, it still does things right. Now, again, after all that, why the fuck did the Dreamcast fail? A few reasons. For one, it came out about a year before the PlayStation 2. You know, we knew that was around the corner. It was a stronger system, and it was going to be one of the best-selling systems ever. It also was marketed more towards a teenage and adult market, so obviously, this one was looking to future-proof itself from time in. But the PlayStation 2 had what I think a lot of other systems didn't really have. The PlayStation 2 came in hardcore with higher storage discs, meaning you could store more game content instead of spreading it across four discs like Shenmue, you had better processing powers, you know, far better in terms of it. I mean, people thought that it could render Toy Story. I mean, that's how it was advertised as. Fuck, Saddam Hussein wanted to daisy chain a couple together, apparently, allegedly, to take over America. It was a crazy powerful system, at least at the time. But it also came with a cheap-ass DVD player, which, believe it or not, means a whole heck of a lot when it comes to buying one system for your house that's going to be stuck under your television. It also helped that Sony started pumping out way more cool and mature titles. I mean, you had your mascot games that were going to appeal to everyone, but at this point, gamers were getting older, okay? So at this point, we were looking more towards the next generation of Resident Evil games, the Metal Gears, uh, you know, fuck, games like Final Fantasy were already mature story-wise. It was only a matter of time before they went even further, started to add shooters like Dirge of Cerberus, I mean, we're never going to forget that, but then you also had games like Grand Theft Auto, which took the concept of Shenmue's world technology, its world simulation, its day-night cycles, to the next level by creating a game that was way more accessible, and it had a far more grandiose design in theory. And again, that's not to say the Dreamcast didn't have good launch games. I mean, again, like I said, you had your Sonics, you had all of that. You had your Soul Calibers, but the reality is this was competing directly with the PlayStation 1. I mean, even the third-party support, you would find games like Grand Theft Auto 2 that would get a weak port on the PlayStation 1, but then immediately look night and day difference, literally, on the Dreamcast. So th that was the system it was competing. It was like a generation... It was, com it was a generation ahead competing with the generation behind, I guess is the best way to say it, right? The best way to really put it. It also didn't help the fact that the Dreamcast had no fucking DRM. Yes, I shit you not. If you had a CD-ROM drive, you could just download Dreamcast games, burn them, and call it a day. Though, even the piracy argument kind of falls flat a little bit, because by the time it became really possible, because of poor mismanagement, the entire system eventually was doomed to failure. Now, why is this story so important when it comes to the context of Shenmue? Well, that's because Shenmue is also one of the most fucking expensive games ever created, okay? You see, whereas Fantasy Star Online is one of those online games that came out and really sort of was the first console online MMO that I think did really well, at least it, at least it, you know, it executed well. I don't really care so much about sales or anything of that nature, but Shenmue was one of the most expensive games of its release. You know, it cost around 45 to 70 million dollars when you finagle in the marketing budget and some of Shenmue 2's budget, which kind of got mixed in with the first game. But despite it being so expensive, it was a commercial failure. Not even from a sales perspective, the thing pulled in over a million sales, which is great for a new IP, but the fact that you had to spend so fucking much, you didn't make much back, and since the system was dying, I mean, remember, the Dreamcast launched really well at the time. They couldn't maintain those sales because of the competition coming in. So again, Shenmue, and by succession, Shenmue 2 was doomed to fail with the hardware that it was releasing on. Now listen, as much as I would love to shit on Shenmue, I have to give credit to Yu Suzuki because he did in fact crap out of what is an ambitious title. Now, Shenmue came out before Grand Theft Auto 3, a game that I think a lot of us know very well. You see, there's no doubt that Rockstar Games pulled magic out of their ass when they were developing GTA 3 for the PlayStation 2, an open world game that you could blow almost anything up in. And while GTA 3 is a popular game that's been deconstructed and held up as a pillar of gaming, Shenmue came out way before, well, you know, relatively before, on, an, on, a, on a much more weaker system, by the way, and was able to pull off some really impressive visuals and also provide a really impressive, you know, graphic effects and, and day and night simulations. In fact, world simulation as a whole, detail alone was at an all-time high for what Shenmue was giving. So to give credit where credit is really due, Yu Suzuki and Sega weren't pulling any punches. I mean, this is a game that took itself so seriously in terms of immersion that they actually captured weather data from that region on those specific times and inputted them into the game as to add more immersiveness and realism. I shit you not, that's a legitimate options menu toggle that you can go into. See, 
Comparing Shenmue to games in 1999 is the smartest choice, okay? Even if you were never interested in the revenge story or the gameplay at all, you'd have people who would just want to see it run and play in the scenes just as a tech demo of games at the time. Yeah, I mean, it was rough around the fucking edges, but holy shit, it's 1999, guys. Computers are about to go full fucking Y2K two days down the road. So enjoy your goddamn gotcha simulator while you're fucking at it, okay? Enjoy your revenge story. God damn! As far as critic reviews went at the time, a lot of people really did appreciate the graphics for its release date. I mean, I'm not the only one saying that it doesn't stand the test of time. There are people to this day that'll look at Shenmue and say, wow, it was impressive. I mean, go look at the Digital Foundry videos. They covered it really well on DF Retro, looking at the visual style and its makeup still working well to this day. And, you know, despite all of that positivity, people were critical of the game's slow pace and uh, the fact that it wasn't exactly the best game out on the market. I mean, <laughs> shit, you were looking at a revenge game that was more of a technical fucking demonstration for looking at things really goddamn closely than it was an actual action-adventure game. But hey, let's get to it. Re Shenmue begins with Ryu coming home to see that his father is being attacked by an individual known as Lan Di, a very important antagonist for this franchise, dying at his hands no less. Lan Di shows up to take a mirror away after killing Hazuki Sr., leaving Ryu to grieve for his dad. A few days pass and Ryu wakes up nightmares later and he decides maybe I should get some revenge. Now at this point, <laughs> this is where Shenmue, uh, Shenmue's genre really does come into question. Is it an action game? Fuck no, barely. I mean, in terms of actual combat, there's only a few times I feel I've ever gotten into actual combat. Is it an adventure game? Uh, well, yeah, but I guess by that definition, fuck anything must be an adventure game. Shit, Toilet Simulator must be a great story if you're, if you're using that as a metric. No, see, this is more a immersive simulator. I think that's the actual genre that we're hitting. Uh, interactive Cinema is a name that I've seen tossed around over here. Uh, walking Simulator would be one that people would showcase. Um, not in Shenmue's case, no, no, no. See, this is still the apex of its of its craft. Now, the first section of the game, Ryo's Bedroom, is a great showcase into what Shenmue really prioritizes, which is the fact that every individual drawer can be opened and closed. The closet door, yeah, you can fuck around with it. Every individual item, hold the L2 button, zoom in, you can peek into it, you can grab it, manipulated around every single detail is captured as much as it can be for a dreamcast game okay but still even by that metric it's a lot of detail to capture and it's not just Ryu's room it's the household it's the yard fuck it's the entire hub world around you nearly every building is enterable and explorable to an extent within reason and in Shenmue 2 and 3, it only gets even wilder. But for Shenmue's one case, understand, this blew people's minds respectively. Yeah, maybe it's not so practical, but Shenmue's world isn't also that big either. But again, even for back then, rendering just this small location with this impeccable of detail is pretty commendable. Now, of course, you have this notebook, which is sort of the objective marker for the game. Again, it's all immersive. So this is where Ryu will write what the, what the next course of action is, or a general summarization of events that have happened before. In the first couple pages, you'll find numbers for emergency services. So if you do want to call the cops and let them handle them, you can until Ryu decides to linearly tell you, no, I will avenge my father myself. That's a better way of doing it, I, I guess, for whatever reason. No, I'll avenge my father's murder on my own. Ryu's first objective is to track that black car that we saw in the yard the day of the dad's murder. And here's where you're going to go into town and you're going to talk. And there's a couple of hub worlds too. Yamanos is the street just outside your house where you'll find the cat side quest and a few characters that you can speak to. Sakura Gaoka is a residential neighborhood with a convenience store and Daobuita is actually the city or rather town in this case if we're going with a metric. This starts a breadcrumb trail where you're going to be talking to random video game NPCs. And you know what's really cool back in the day is that every single one of these NPCs is voiced. Not by an individual voice actor, I want you to imagine it's, you know, a couple people doing the voices for everyone, but for back then, it's a voice for every character. And it's not as crazy impressive when you look at it from a game developer perspective. Uh, really, these NPCs have a few lines of important dialogue that they'll tell you pertaining to a current situation that you're in at the game at the time. And then after those two lines will be repetitive lines that'll tell you, Hey, Ryu! Uh, sorry, I have shit to do. Bye. Good luck with your dead dad. That's sort of the dialogue that you're going with. I mean, back then it blew you away in 1999. 
And to this day, I appreciate what they're going with, okay? Uh, dialogue choices? <laughs> no, there's no fucking dialogue choice for Shenmue. Uh, see, the game has an interesting method where, imagine if A is the interact button. Yeah, you're gonna have to get real comfortable talking to somebody, having a long, awkward pause, tapping over and over again to finish dialogue. That's how it works. In fact, the dialogue is a little too goofy too. Uh, quite literally, it's way disjointed. I'm not talking about audio quality. Like, I know it sounds like Ryu... <laughs> That's because the game is from 1999 with off audio quality no i'm talking about the actual voice dialogue all right like if you just listen to it it's fucking insane hey if it's what you've decided it's what you've decided Ryo, don't do anything stupid of course i won't i'll always treasure this Ryo, take care of yours too i will I'll come back when I'm on vacation. Have you heard about my dad? No! Okay, have a good day. That's the, uh, that's the level of dialogue that you'll have to come across, okay? It's very fucking disjointing, alright? Uh, it's all over the place, there's no, like, smoothness in the dialogue. And I'm gonna attribute that to the fact that it's a game from 1999, and it does get better in Shenmue 2, a lot better. But that's sort of what you're gonna have to get used to, okay? Now, during this entire dealio, you'll come across one of your first side quests in the game, which is where you have to take care of this cat. And I want you to really savor these side quests, because uh, it's gonna be one of the few things the game allows you to do to break up the god-awful pacing that we're gonna look at just down the road. Uh, I made it a mission to take care of this cat until it came back to full health by fetching it milk every morning, and by the time I came home to finish the day, I would give it some, you know, tuna fish. I wouldn't give it, like, fresh fish, because, I mean, that costs a lot of fucking money, and with the with the 500 yen that Ine-san keeps on giving me at the end of every, er, beginning of each day, that ain't nothing to cover this thing's budget, that's for goddamn sure. Yeah, you get 500 yen each day. It isn't until much later in the game that you start to develop an actual goddamn income, but for the first little bit, you're poor. And money really doesn't have much of an importance in Shenmue 1. It isn't until Shenmue 2 when you start paying fucking rent, but that's a whole separate story. Shenmue 1's money requirement isn't really that necessary. There's a few things you can do with money, like go to a convenience store and buy batteries. Uh, you buy some soft drinks on the side of the road, hoping to God you're lucky enough to get the special can that lets you redeem yellow supersonic. Uh, there's also the option of opening up fucking gotchas, because that's a big thing in Shenmue. That's one of the ways you pass time, but yeah, money's not really a focal point, all right? There's there's one necessary part of the game where you need it, but for the most part, it just sort of sits there, all right? So you can play arcade games, do whatever you want, but that's the general usage for money in Shenmue. Anyways, everyone here tells you to go talk to the Chinese community, because they're the ones that know everything about the Chinese locals that keep coming into the area. Here, the game gives you a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a stop Asian hate type message going on for you. And then you find Tom, the one American character who is uh, stuck in an infinite dance loop. Uh, I've made my own lore regarding Tom dancing for hours upon hours every day. I think Tom is on crack, alright? That's what I- I'm getting a rough idea that Tom touches the crack pipe a little too fucking much. Because no one has this much goddamn energy. I like Tom, but he's not really that helpful into the game. I mean, every time I ask this motherfucker about the most basic shit- No, Ryu, man! I got nothing to help you! Want a hot dog? Ryu, want a hot dog? No, Tom. I don't want a fucking hot dog. In fact, that's one of my complaints with Shenmue. Why is it that I don't have a choice in buying a hot dog? from Tom. Why is there no health support Tom's hot dog crack addiction business speedrun percent? Why doesn't that happen? I don't fucking know. But the game, that, that, that's just Tom's character in general, okay? I'm talking about it way too much. The local Chinese restaurants tell you about the Three Blades, a community of individuals uh, who work as chefs, barbers, and tailors. Ha! Ah. Get it? They all use blades. Ha ha ha! Anyways, you end up finding out from one of the Chinese elders uh, that the person who killed Hazuki Sr. actually belongs to a Chinese cartel. And you're better at left up talking to sailors. And boy, the fucking sailors. You know, anybody you'll talk about who tells you about Shenmue will constantly mention the sailors. Oh, the sailors. Now, finding these sailors involves that you wait until 7 p.m. And I'm going to give Shenmue some goddamn credit here, okay? Shenmue, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, has an absolutely impeccable day-to-night cycle. I swear you could look up at this game and see actual proper star constellations. It's not hard to do that, but for 1999, good job, Yu Suzuki. You did a 
bang up job on that one. Now, after 7 p.m., the day turns into night and Ryu is out of town. The bar district has opened and you can actually go inside and play pool with one of the sailor groups. Uh, a g mini game that I've never been able to successfully do right. I swear to God, I can't play pool in a video game. So I ended up fucking this shit up. And eventually during the night, you'll find one real shady one tucked away away from the in-game street maps, by the way, no less. Now, Heartbeats is the bar that is full of the absolute shadiest of scummy characters. So shady, in fact, that the game introduces you to one of its core components, quick time events. Oh, you might be like, what? Quick time? Yeah, Shenmue popularized quick time events. Actually, I think Shenmue brought them into the party. You might be thinking, that Dragon Lair game I saw in AVGN, mm -mm -mm -mm. no game does quick time events as immensely as Shenmue. You ever wanted to put a controller down in the middle of gaming? Pfft, fuck that with Shenmue, you're never gonna do that shit success. The game will give you a quick time event just for blinking sometimes. Straight fresh hell out of nowhere. And while I'm okay with that, you know, I've played games with quick time events, um, these quick time events have literally no chill, all right? And let me tell you something, the window of success on these are so inconsistent, it's not even funny. Some of them, you'll be able to hit with relative ease. Sometimes they'll flash an arrow on the screen, and if you're not touching it at that right fucking nanosecond, you will fail. You're allowed to fail a few times before the game immediately screws up that checkpoint or the quick time event for you. And the stakes are so low in that regard. In fact, Shenmue's difficulty is so low that the game will just consistently allow you to fuck up. You can fuck up like a hundred times and the game will just rewind you back and you can continue like nothing happened. Now, there are some exceptions to that rule, some exceptions, but for, in generally the game doesn't have any problems with players screwing up. Even the battles alone, which there are only a handful of, you can choose to screw up, you can actually lose a few times, and I swear to God, I think the game just gets easier or gives you more health, or it maybe makes you damage even harder, just to make the battle easier the more you fail. So sh losing in Shenmue isn't a big deal. You're always gonna win. This game is literally a fucking participation trophy for light, like 99% of its audience. At Heartbeats, you find out there's this fella named Charlie that has some more information, and this is where, oh boy, the real problems start showing out. Finding Charlie isn't exactly the hardest thing, you just, th wait a minute, wait a minute, stop! I know, I I'm telepathically understanding, wait a second. As awkward as the dialogue in this game is, as awkward as this moment is, you're probably wondering, Muda, what's up with the fighting? Ho <laughs> good question, because literally an hour and a half into recording this fucking game, I have found out that this is where the first fight technically begins. They ship you off to some sailors, uh, you know, the, this, this like empty parking lot where you end up fighting other characters. Now, let me explain the fighting in this game. As little as there is, most of the time you'll ever touch the fighting engine is if you willingly go out to practice. There's a lot of moves. Hell, there I think are there, I think there are ways to even level up the moves, but the combat is generally weighty. In fact, I believe it's quite literally just ripped out of Virtua Fighter to an extent. There's a punch, there's a kick, there's a block, there's a grab. There's combinations you can pull off and there's skills that you can find in the world, buy, and then learn. Uh, a little meaningless, I mean, the combat is easy. I, like I said earlier, no matter how much you lose, I feel like the game just gets easier as time goes on. Eventually, after a few fights and talking to people around the time, you track Charlie down to this apartment tattoo parlor, and that's where the big problem now arises. See, Shenmue uses a 24-hour time system evident since I said the uh, you know day night cycle is a thing and you probably noticed in the gameplay footage there's a clock all right up into the top right see that clock is running in I believe what four times real world speed or something like it's a faster version of real game time point is you are going to spend each day waking up at 8 a.m. and you're going to go to bed past 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. see you can't go to bed early all right, you can't pass the time unless you just walk around. No, you literally have to sit there and watch the time manually pass. I've heard people say that if you open up the watch in the game, time passes faster, but I honestly think that's either madness invoking into me or it's a fucking placebo effect because this game has some long bullshit pacing wait times. All right, there's a reason this game is unspeed runnable sometimes. And let me explain it. So let's say that going to Charlie at this apartment parlor, right? You find out where it is at 3 p.m., right? That day. You find out to come back the next day. 
So what do you fucking do? Well, you can either fuck around in the game and do its few objectives, like finish up maybe a side quest if you're lucky, uh, open up some gotchas where Ryu buys a gotcha for like 100 yen, opens the capsule, looks around it. Oh, oh, that's Sonic, huh? Oh, that's a truck. Oh, that's a dice. <laughs> you either do that, you, you drink some soda, you, you place it, you buy some shit at the convenience store, you walk around, you look at Tom fucking dance. That's all you can do. So you have to make sure you kill enough time for 3 p.m. in game to turn to 8 p.m. so you can move on to the next day. Then you wake up at 8 p.m. Now here's where the pacing gets even more fucked. The game will tell you show up around 1 p.m. So now you leave the house at 8 p.m. 8 a.m. You feed the cat. You do whatever you can. There's no fight really to happen. Maybe there's an uh, maybe there's like an optional cutscene to watch, but you're literally waiting from eight to to like fucking whatever time the game tells you to do. And this is what kills the pacing because 99% of gamers are just either going to be on their cell phone. I have fallen asleep. All right, waiting for an objective to kick in on this game. It is embarrassingly bad how poorly this section is paced. There are not enough activities in the game to make this time go by any faster, okay? After you've played the arcade games for like a few hours, after you've done boring shit for enough, there is not enough activities. There's only so much of Dobu Ito a player can run around and experience until they get fucking bored. This is what kills the pacing if you're interested in the revenge story at all. Like I said earlier, this is a game that invests you, this is a game, this is a revenge story that has you filing taxes every once in a while. You're gonna have to do the boring, mundane shit. I wouldn't be surprised if Yu Suzuki at one point had a BM movement mechanic in the game where you had to regularly take pisses and shits. I'm surprised that Yu Suzuki didn't input a fucking choke the chicken mini game so that Ryu could sleep well at night. I'm surprised basic shit like that is put into the game at this point if realism and immersion is what you're going for, okay? You know, sometimes story progression can just be, hey, Hey, talk to this person one day, you know, just just have one conversation. Hey, show up the next day And then you just sit there waiting and watching Tom dance every fucking excruciating minute of the day So after the next couple days of this, you know, nightmare in, in, uh, in purgatory storyland Ine-san ends up giving you an actual letter written in Chinese You find this little Chinese kid getting bullied just outside your house Well, yeah, a little down your house By some gangster rejects I mean, who's bullying a little kid? Get the fuck out of here So once you get into, like, what, the, the one out of the six fights in the entire game You end up saving this Chinese kid who takes you to his grandmother Who then converts and translates this letter for you Inside the letter is a passphrase Father's Heaven and Nine Dragons, Mother Earth's and Comrades, each of these corresponding to their respective partners and phrases. You get a phone number and a warning of those who pursue the mirror. Remember that mirror we saw in the beginning? Yeah, that's all tying in now. So calling this number leads you to a goose chase where you go to the final hub world in the entire game, uh, which is the new Yukasoka Harbor. The Harbor hub world is one of the second biggest hub worlds that you can find. And at this point, once you've reached this level of the game, this is where you're going to be spending a great chunk of your time. So here you have to find warehouse number eight. And here you spend the entire day talking to everyone. Now, this Harbor section is where I really want to reiterate one of the strongest points of Shenmue's gameplay, right? or Shenmue's experience, rather. Now, going to the harbor, every bus has its schedule. You know, they change differently depending on whether it's a weekday or even a weekend or a holiday. And what's even more important in this situation is when you get down to the harbor, how are you finding warehouse number eight? Or is it the numbers on the side of the warehouse? Is it talking to the various people around the harbor? Is it helping the homeless guy when he gets thrown out of an area by giving him some coffee? There's a million ways, well, that's a bit hyperbolic, but there's a lot of ways, a lot of interactions a player can miss. And this is throughout the entire game. Whether you're looking for the black car or the sailors or Charlie or, you know, the warehouse number eight in this case, there are multiple ways that you'll eventually end up coming towards something. There's a great, I would say, uh, there, 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 there's a great feeling to open up a notebook or look around at a map hidden in the game area, or just generally use your actual deduction and, and perception to really come down to finding a location hidden. Or there's an experience right there that isn't really captured in games of today. One of the biggest problems I have in modern day video gaming is the real, the, the, the sort of um, the, the HUD issue where the game will always oftentimes just put a giant marker where you have to go 
go anyways. One of the coolest things that I've seen in games like Assassin's Creed lately is instead of just throwing a marker down, the game will give you clues and say, hey, it's in this location, bit north of this river, blah, blah, whatever. Yeah, it's kind of a marker, but the fact that you have to put some modicum of effort into figuring out something is a lost art in today's gaming, and one that I feel only games like Shenmue, or in this case only Shenmue, has ever really captured, and that's one thing, no matter how much you hate or love this game, this is something that sets Shenmue apart, and it sets it apart in a very positive way. And if I had to tell you to play the game just to experience gameplay like this once, that's absolutely worth it. So finding the warehouse proper, you talk to everyone, you know, you miss some interactions, you see some interactions, eventually end up sneaking into the old warehouse district and finding warehouse number eight, where you find a character named Master Chen, who explains that the mirror Lan Di took was just one of two, and the other still exists, the Phoenix Mirror, a mirror that's going to be real important in the entire Shenmue saga going forward. This next section has you exploring your own house, searching literally every nook and every cranny, every drawer to find mysterious keys, that lead into special rooms, family heirlooms, that eventually fit into secret keyholes hidden behind scrolls in multiple parts of the house. I mean, this is some real cool shit. I mean, if we're talking about detail in video games, this is where it matters from a story and gameplay perspective. Now here you also get to fight Master Chen's son, who says he'll bodyguard you because I guess you'll become really important down in the story, and you'll also get your glimpse at the crackhead of the game, known as Chai, who's got some real fucking meth energy built up, one you'll be fighting very soon. Long story short, you'll spend a lot of uh, you'll spend a lot of time at the Hazuki house, basically looking around and checking, uh, you know, for various keyholes. You'll be going into town, Dobuita, to check around local antique parlors to pick up what's left of your father's last belongings, and eventually you'll come across a room hidden underneath the dojo. And wait, it's too dark to go in the dojo. I'm not fucking with you. <laughs> this blew my mind even on a second playthrough. The game makes you go out and fetch a fucking flashlight or light bolts, whatever your choice is, to continue looking. I shit you not. So guess what? I had to leave the dojo, run outside, and hope and pray to God the store was open, which it was. I went to the store, you know, the convenience store down in the city. I bought some flashlights. I bought some flash bulbs. I bought whatever you want to call it. And I came back and finally continued my exploration. This is the thing with Shenmue. It's a great, interesting story. Occasionally, it'll make you do some busy fucking work too. That's the thing about it, okay? That's what Shenmue does. And if it's any, that's part of the entire experience. So at this point, you end up going down into your basement and you find out in a false space that there's this Phoenix mirror. And then you call up, you know, Master Chen again. You meet him at the warehouse. And this is where Master Chen tells you about Mad Angels, the Chiyu men group that's based in China, and the fact that you're a kid and you probably shouldn't be chasing revenge. A lot of people will tell you this and Ryu will tell you, no, I must avenge my father. And avenge he hopefully will, I guess. I'm not gonna spoil things. Anyways, at this point, Chai shows up and tries to steal the mirror, and at this point I was really focused on the story, so I fucked up initially, because they gave you a quick time event out of nowhere. So again, make sure you never put the controller down, because that shit tends to happen. Ryu's next step is to actually take a ticket and go to Hong Kong to continue this revenge story, and for that, he's gonna have to do what all of us do, and that's getting fucked by travel prices. Yeah, I shit you not. Ryu is a high school student, meaning that he is in fact poorer than a medical student, okay? And for that, he has to find the cheapest way of traveling. Whether that is, you know, literally swimming across the shore, whatever you want to call it, that's how it works. Nozomi, who's another character in the entire piece, and if you don't know who Nozomi is, I guess I'll explain it real quick. There are a few other characters. Nozomi is Ryu's sort of like love interest. Um, you really have to develop your communication with her. You have to call her every night. You have to talk to her to really develop that. But she's one of the characters that Ryu will confide and talk with. And she'll tell you, hey, I go to Canada all the time. Sometimes we have to go by boat because grandma's really scared of the planes. So she tells you you can get a cheaper ticket and you find find a travel agency. I shit you not, you go to the map, you study it, and it tells you, hey, that's a travel company. You go to the travel company, the cheapest one, and you ask them, can I have this ticket? And they'll tell you, yeah, we do have a ticket. And Ryu realizing, wow, I'm poor, but even I can afford that, has this moment of giving his money up and being told to come up four hours later. So you know what? You can watch Tom dance for the fucking time that it takes to wait. And you come back four hours later and you're getting scammed, obviously. So, one quick time event and fight later, you find out that, okay, come back tomorrow. 
Come back tomorrow to get your fucking ticket. So now you watch Tom dance a little bit more, you go back home, sleep, and you show up at the arcade. At the arcade, you find out that Chai is over there, the crack den meth addict that he is, shows up, eats your fucking ticket, and starts a fight with you. Now, of course, understandably, you probably want to fight Chai back too. But Chai, being a meth addict, has about 30 plus to strain, so if you think you're beating this guy, whew, never gonna happen. Some people have, and the grand reward for that is uh, nothing. All right? There's nothing that you get by losing or winning this fight. You're just supposed to lose it anyways. So at this point, this is where the real meme comes out for Shenmue. The, the job. You ever hear people talk about this game and they'll tell you, Oh, is that the game with the forklift job? The actual full-time job? Yes! This is the game with a full-on full-time job work week, motherfucker! Get ready! So the next section of this game has you going down back to the harbor, where you eventually have to go get a job to learn about the Mad Angels gang. It doesn't help the fact that the Mad Angels themselves have their entire fucking logo plastered on one of the warehouse's door in Time's New Large font. So again, finding these guys isn't that difficult, but Shenmue wants you to do what Shenmue wants you to do. Eventually end up getting a job at the harbor from one of these uh, foremen that don't care about child labor laws. So he ends up giving you a forklift job with no certification, by the way. That's a, uh, <laughs> that's, that's real great. And here comes the forklift gameplay loop. So let me explain something. There are five days you have to do this. Each day, Ryu comes into work at eight o'clock. He does the same race, the exact same race, they don't change the race up to reflect the path that you'll be taking each day delivering crates. No, no, no. It's the same race. No difference to any outcome. You could win, lose, whatever. All that changes is your supervisor, Mark, gives you a different dangling chibi as a sign of failure every time. After this race, you start your job where the game will give you a map that tells you take the crates from this location and move it to another location. Now, wait, you might be wondering, Muda, <laughs> there's plenty of games that have these job-like sections. Hell, remember San Andreas had you on a forklift moving like three crates? Yeah, three crates. Shenmue, you think after the third crate, they switch to a cutscene and it just shows Ryu moving day to day? No, you move every fucking crate. And the idea is to meet quota. So you get your 50 yen raise every day. It's not terribly difficult to meet this quota considering all you can do for that entire work day, the nine to five, is move boxes. Okay, so you might as well get fucking acclimated. Now moving boxes, you have a, a, you have a lunch hour and a half in between you'll be going back to moving boxes so yeah after the whole box moving shenanigan you'll have some fights here and there that'll break out and you'll learn a bit more about the mad angels right eventually on the fifth day you know these idiots who again by the way have graffitied their gang logo onto one side of the harbor and everyone in the area doesn't want to talk about it for some fucking stupid reason uh decide to uh do some shenanigans all right not before getting you out of a job See, after the couple fights that you have and the quick time events, it's enough for your foreman to fire you from a job, okay? So you end up going home that day depressed as always until you find out on the phone that, what's up? Oh no, <laughs> the Nozomi's been kidnapped. Yeah, the Mad Angels have kidnapped the high schooler. My God, this is, this is just fucking embarrassing. <laughs> Now, at this point, Ryu wakes up at 10 o'clock and the game finally allows you to go out past its hours, okay? The curfew has been lifted. You head into town and you find out one of your neighbors has a motorcycle, so you ring their doorbell and you say, Hey, can I borrow it at 11? And they're like, sure, Ryu, why the fuck not? I mean, you should call the police if someone's been kidnapped, but it's a revenge story, guys. Who cares? So you end up taking this motorcycle and finally, some breath of fresh air as the gameplay slightly changes. Now, this motorcycle section isn't that crazy. There's no traffic for some reason. Uh, it's a straight line. And uh, the actual margin to winning is so razor fucking thin that if you actually screw up once during a turn, you may have to repeat the whole process over again. That also means watching the cutscene, because they're not, they're not skippable by any imagination. At least some of them aren't. Uh, this one in particular isn't. You end up racing all the way back to the harbor, and you end up going to the Mad Angels uh, warehouse, where they have their giant logo plastered, and you rescue Nozomi after going through a couple fights, and ooh, a quick time event, yeah. After this, you end up making a deal with one of the bosses, and you say, listen, I will, I will gladly beat up uh, Master Chen's son, if you can take me to Lan Di, to which 
Yeah, I guess that's happening. So you end up waiting one more day and you go back to the harbor where you can learn a new move from Tom. And if you've developed and cultivated a relationship, watch him finally move back to the United States. It's truly interesting because if you actually end up doing all these side quests, which they're missable, but given the fact that there's almost nothing to do in the game, you'll probably end up finding this shit down the road and, you know, committing to it. That uh, you'll end up seeing all these relationships cultivate, blossom, and move on away. Uh, Nozomi is kind of important. Even if you haven't put all your time in with her, the game will give you these key relationships and moments and insight into her life that is genuinely interesting, okay? I will say, the character relationships in Shenmue are very important. And to me, they're done really well. So anyways, Tom ends up moving back to the States, teaches you a couple moves, and you're finally able to move on to kicking Master Chen's kid. So you end up fighting Gui Zhang, and Gui Zhang ends up, uh, you know, sort of taking you on for real, until you find out that, oh no, it's a setup! I made a deal with the DEVIL! So this starts what is known as the 70 man battle. No, it's not some battle royale, no 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 no. See, what happens is you and Gui Zhang are tossed into this literal 70 man gauntlet with full of actual minions and mini bosses. Now, these guys take a punch or two to waste, but this is the definition of you getting fucking Zerg rushed. Now, this section isn't necessarily difficult, but you're gonna have to get used to either two things, learning the fucking fighting mechanic, which I never did, or cheesing it by running away and creeping your health back up slowly and hopefully beating everything. There's no shame to cheesing this fight. They literally throw one boss at you that can just outright grab you and fuck you up to no end. So you better get used to cheesing this fight and landing it piecemeal hits at a time, chipping away damage in order to win, okay? This is like Yakuza 3 combat at its finest. After you've done the 70 man battle and you found out, you know, listen, I have got to commit my ass to this revenge story. Uh, Hazuki finally realizes, shit man, I have to go to Hong Kong. And finally, travel arrangements are made by Master Chen, who can help not only Ryu get to Hong Kong, but acclimate well within the Chinese community over there. So this takes you to the final evening of Shenmue, where all you have to do is make sure that you're set to go, say your goodbyes, you know, have whatever money you have on you, and move on with your life. So by the time you get to the harbor, ladies and gentlemen, you have one last fight in the game. And who's that fight with? Well, it's our resident, sleeper, favorite crackhead, Chai. Now, believe it or not, this is the hardest fight the game has to offer. I don't really know what Chai does in this game other than be an obvious reference to, I guess, Lord of the fucking Rings. But, um, Chai, believe it or not, is just this crack meth energy motherfucker. They do teach you a swallow dive move before this fight that if you learn how to use it effectively, you can absolutely cheese the Chai fight and win it completely. Which I did, and I won. And this takes you to the final credit screen of Shenmue. It is fair to say that this game was planned well ahead with Shenmue 2 in mind, since there are a lot of characters, namely Shenhua, the girl you see on the cover of Shenmue 3, that shows up very much into Shenmue 2. So Yu Suzuki planned this out well in advance, and this final ending to it is honestly... I gotta say it's done really well. You know, it is... I'll explain one thing real quick, okay? For me, this kind of caused a bit of a Hideo Kojima moment with a game that's handling its cinematography pretty well. And if it's one thing that I haven't mentioned at all, really, that I should have, is the soundtrack. I know in some cases, some tracks, you know, they're just... They're, they're not nothing to write home about. But when this game is trying to go for that cinematic flair, Yu Suzuki's, like, talent comes out hardcore and finding the absolute perfect music to pair with the scene you're watching. And in a way, Shenmue's story becomes almost magical. It becomes something worth experiencing. And from a story perspective, I like it, okay? I want to see this revenge story. Despite all of the gameplay pacing hiccups and issues, if Shenmue was just a movie on a disc, it would be a good movie. And that's the problem with it. It's a bad game, all right? It's an awful game, but it's an awful game that has some moments. Now, the gameplay is dated, again, even for when it came out, by the way. It does not hold up whatsoever. Listen, there is nobody in the world that's going to convince me Shenmue isn't an awful game, okay? It is an awful game, but it's an awful game that is absolutely worth playing. Because while the gameplay is dated, 
for sure. You know, nobody can tell me the combat system isn't dated, the movement tank control isn't janky even for 1999 standards. Ironically, the boring aspects of Shenmue make it a reason worth playing, make it an experience jumping down into. Because the gameplay that makes it the strongest is the gameplay that has never been recreated in modern day gaming at all, which is this level of immersive exploration. This concept of, hey, I have to go down to the harbor and find this individual. You're not just going to find him through a marker. No, you have to go to the harbor, you have to talk to the security people, you have to talk to the cafeteria, you have to talk to the fucking hobo, you have to get into a fight here and there, you have to watch, you know, generally, there's a lot that goes into this game that has never been done, for better or for worse, in modern day gaming. It's a revenge story with an absolute hard-on for fucking immersion. The soundtrack is definitely underrated, like I said before, but even more underrated than that is the phenomenal detail for the time that this game came out. When the game wants to have a cutscene beyond the average in-engine dialogue, it's an absolute breath of fresh air to constantly watch, okay? To this day, a game from 1999 is standing up with modern day video games. Is it worth playing at least once, even if you'll end up hating the game? Absolutely! You know, Shenmue 4 is slated to come out and finish this entire saga off, whenever that will fucking come out, I guess, but I'm excited to at least see Shenmue 4. Despite the disappointment in gameplay even Shenmue 3 has brought, there's a certain charm that the Shenmue franchise has that's unrivaled and unmatched. This is a case of an individual making a game that is objectively, in my opinion, a bad game but an experience absolutely worth playing. I think when people say, are games fucking art? This might be art, okay? This might actually be the definition of proper art, because it's the definition of a man who's designed a game that has focused so much on immersion and simulation that I think he's, I think Yu Suzuki has forgotten that at some point he was developing a video game. And in a way, that's kind of what makes Shenmue Shenmue, and a game absolutely worth playing. And if I sound like a broken record, listen, at the end, I still hate this game. I still think it is an absolute boring pile of shit. But even a boring pile of shit is worth playing if there are aspects of it that I feel have not only inspired games of modern era, but have made it so that those same games have never been able to match the quality at least exhibited by Shenmue to an extent. I know that's a weird statement to make, but it's just me basically telling you, you have to play this game regardless of what anyone tells you. It is absolutely worth the 15 hours that you will lose of your life to truly understand what Shenmue is and where it came from. And you know what? If at the end of the day you want something to refute that statement, I'm the same dumb motherfucker that Platinum Death Stranding. So maybe that makes my opinion invalid. I don't really care. At the end of the day, I had to get my Shenmue out of my system. But you know what? It's not out of my system. Because I have to make a video double the length of this when Shenmue 2 has to be talked from my mouth. And then hopefully Shenmue 3. And by the time Shenmue 4 comes out and I'm not collecting social fucking security checks, maybe a video on that one. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Yu Suzuki's greatest shitpost, reviewed by another shitposter. What a world we live in. This is me, Mudaharn. If you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.